Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Arman Financial Services Limited 2Q and H1 FY23 earnings conference call hosted by Intred Equities. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Jignesh Shial from Intrad Equities. Thank you and over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Aman, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of Intrad Equities, I welcome you all to Arman Financial Services Limited 2Q and H1 FI23 earnings conference call. We have along with us Mr. Jayendrabhai Patil, Vice Chairman and Managing Director, Mr. Alok Patil, Joint Managing Director, and Mr. Vivek Modi, Group CFO. We are thankful to the management for allowing us this opportunity. I would now like to hand it over to Mr. Jandrabai Patel, Vice Chairman and Managing Director of Arman Financial Services Limited for his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Jignesh. On behalf of Arman Financial Services Limited, I extend a warm welcome to our Q2 and H1 FY23 earnings conference call. With me, I have Alok Patel, Joint Managing Director, and Vivek Modi, Group CFO. We have also on the call representatives from SGA, the investor relation team. I hope everyone has an opportunity to go through the results and presentation for the quarter and half year ended September 30, 2022, which was uploaded on the stock exchanges and the company website. In the past two years, microfinance sector has successfully navigated the pandemic and is back on the track showing healthy demand. Additionally, the Reserve Bank of India's new guidelines is expected to help the industry grow even faster. During the H1 FY23, the industry was focused on adapting these new norms on account of which the loan disbursement was highly subdued. However, the microfinance business has emerged as one of the important tools for promoting financial inclusion and serves as the last mile of credit to those at the bottom of the pyramid. And at Arman, we are focused, we are focused on serving the low-income, underserved regions of the nation, promoting livelihoods and offering microcredit to socio-economically backward people who have little to no access to the formal banking or financial services system. At present, we have a presence in eight states with comprehensive branch network of 313 and a workforce of 2,620. Of all the states, Gujarat contributes 31.9% to our AUM on a consolidated basis, followed by Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, and Rajasthan. Company has recently followed in two new states of Bihar and Haryana. We will continue to focus on extending our presence in newer districts in existing states while also exploring new states. On consolidated basis, gross NPA stood at 3.3% and net NPA stood at 0.1%, showing an improvement of 230 BPS and 100 BPS respectively on account of improvements in collection efforts and lower provisioning. Cumulative provision stood at INR 70 crore, that is 4.9% of the consolidated AUM and 5.2% on book POS, portfolio outstanding. Therefore, total provisions remain much higher than GNPA. Collective collection efficiency improved to 98.3% in October 2022 as compared to 95.3% in March 2022. Collection efficiency across all segments has shown improvement and aligned with the pre-COVID levels pre-COVID levels, this was mainly due to the passionate 
on ground workforce continuous customer interactions and a customer focused approach collection efficiency for october 2022 for various segments stood as follows microfinance segment 98.4% msme segments 98.1% two wheeler collection 96.7% now coming to the borrowing profile and liquidity as on 30th september 2022 company has total borrowings worth inr 1419 crore of the total borrowings 53.8 percent is through banks and nbfcs 21.7 percent is through securitization and ptc route and 14.1 percent is through ncds and is the rest is borrowed through dfis ecbs and direct assignments i am happy to share that during the quarter company successfully raised i indian inr 115 crore via allotment of ccds and ocrps on a preferential basis the arrangement stands as follows company has allotted 6,24,388 unsecured compulsory convertible debentures, or what you call CCDs, amounting to INR 77 crore. Some of the marquee investors include fund or funds controlled by Singapore-based 16th Street Capital and USA-based Seven Canyons Advisors. other investors include both domestic and foreign individuals company has also allotted 310972 optionally convertible redeemable preference shares or you can call them ocprs ocrps amounting to inr 38 crore these were allotted to individual investors and family offices the mix of tier 1 and 2 equity capital will be used to fund the targeted growth plans of approximately inr 2500 crore with a healthy capital adequacy and a debt equity ratio by leveraging our presence in the mfi msme two wheeler and other loan segments which will enable the company to achieve a sustainable growth momentum in the coming few quarters as per i n in as company is required to split hybrid instruments into debt and equity and therefore the company's balance sheet net worth stood at inr 311 crore however fully diluted net worth assuming full conversion stands at inr 362 crore also we have a healthy liquidity position with inr 376 crore in cash bank balance liquid investments and undrawn cc limits capital adequacy for arman on stand alone basis stands at 51.21% i repeat 51.21% and for number our subsidiary at stands at 20.51% with the equity fund raised and new los ms lms system we will steer the next phase of our growth and expansion by harnessing the power of technology and innovations to create a smarter organization that will enhance customer experience we will grow this business at a careful but steady pace by spreading our spreading out across states building necessary capabilities and adding relevant resources with that i would like to request the operator to open the floor for any questions and answer session thank you all so much for joining thank you operator thank you. yes sir thank you very much we will now begin the question and answer session anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on their touchstone telephone 
If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. First question is in the line of Virat from Shah Investments. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Uh, sir, what kind of AUM and disbursement growth are we targeting for FY23? Any comments on that? Uh, no comments on that. Uh, typically, we try to grow between 35 to 40 percent CAGR over the long run. So it will be somewhere in line with that. Uh, okay. But we on uh, projected results for FY uh, for for next year. Uh, okay. Sir, and uh, how do we plan to utilize the fundraise of rupees one one five crores? Um, so, as you know, in an NBFC, uh, there are uh, regulated ratios to maintain, namely the capital adequacy ratio, and uh, we were approaching close to that, and hence yeah. uh, was required for us to raise this excess capital. And the funds will be used just for onward lending. So, and to leverage on top of that to increase our AUMs. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Any participants who wish to ask a question at this time, they may please press star and one. The next question is from the line of Anjana from Shah Investments, please go ahead. Thank you for this opportunity, sir. A couple of questions from my end. So the first one, I would just want to know if you could throw some light on uh, the reduction of our MFI book. So, you know, we plan to reduce our MFI book to some 60% of AUM. Could you elaborate on the same? We plan to reduce our MFI book by 60%. Uh, no, two sixty percent of AUM. Two sixty percent of AUM. Uh, I mean, so, so uh, you're talking of the pie in the sense from something like eighty percent to brought down to sixty percent. Are you trying to say that? Right, sir. Yes, that's right. No, I mean there is a long-term plan to diversify the product line into other ancillary products like uh, micro enterprise that we have, which is about forty percent. <laughs> Uh, we have also, uh, you know, have individual business loans, which is 2%. Two-wheeler loans is 4%. So the long-term goal is to, you know, get more into uh, micro-ancillary products rather than the JLG product. But we still very much plan to be in the micro-retail segment serving the rural customers. Uh, but I think that is what you are referring to. Uh, overall... Sure time goes on, I think uh, more more and more, uh, you know, uh, the microfinance segment has been showing extremely good growth in the past uh, 10 to 12 years. And uh, going forward, we expect it to continue growing at least for another three to five years. Post that, there'll be, uh, the expectation is that the other products uh, such as micro enterprise and individual business loans uh, will start showing more growth than the JLG based group loans. Now, these are estimates, of course. Uh, the market forces will behave as they behave down the future, but that is our expectation. Sure, sure. So, also, uh, how do we see our two wheeler and MSME business panning out? They are doing extreme, I mean, so we'll take one at a time. So MSME is doing extremely well. <laughs> I think over COVID, it has performed really well as, as well. But it takes a very specific kind of customer. And if you are comparing, like, let's say, a growth rate between group-based unsecured JLG lending uh, versus, you know, the micro-enterprise with much higher underwriting and everything, 
it, it's not very very comparable so the growth rates might be a little dwarfed uh, by the rate of what microfinance is growing but still msme stands on its own and is an extremely good and extremely profitable segment that we are running now as far as micro or as far as two wheeler is concerned uh, you know that industry has been in the doldrum since covid and even before that i think if you look at the amount of vehicles sold in 2019 at somewhere around 21 million to uh, somewhere around 13 million in the last 12 months overall the 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 volumes of two wheeler sales have declined drastically over the last 3 or years uh, so we have not completely discounted two wheeler it's hanging in there uh, but there are tough times uh, in the past and probably tough times in the future as well for the two wheeler segment sure sir understood uh, so we have started dispersing loans under idl segment how do we see this panning out in coming quarter um so coming quarter maybe it's too early to tell but uh, in the coming couple of years the the idea is that a lot of these microfinance customers who have been with the company for several years you know 5 to 6 years and have been microfinance customers for uh, you know 10 to 15 years even in many cases uh, they rightfully so there is a requirement ke we graduate them away from these group based loans into individual loans and the natural progression and evolution also is to get away from cash based collection into cashless collection so that is the goal overall and i think it will take a couple of years to gain uh, good traction in this uh, industry but we are planting seeds right now as far as uh, you know diverging away from pure glg based group based microfinance understood but then so with these ibl loans do we foresee any risk based uh, pricing model coming in play which was not possible under glg risk in terms of what you said pricing risk. so uh, uh, yes, in sir. terms of uh, risk based pricing model basically no i mean lot of these customers are have been with us and have a amazing track record even during covid so i consider these customers to be uh you know very very safe and let me also tell you that uh, the repayment rate in this segment although it's only uh, uh you know 2% of the book the repayment rate is 100% we don't have one rupee in overdue or default in this segment so far it's a little early to celebrate but uh, we consider this as very low risk customers Uh, um, Vivek, uh, yeah. So uh, largely uh, at this stage, uh, these are basically uh, our own set of customers who probably are uh, dropping out of JLG, and hence uh, it's about retaining the best-in-class customers with with you through a product innovation. Over a longer period, since these uh, would become a kind of a uh, full banking kind of customers. uh we might also kind of graduate over a period of time to uh, to a larger ticket size loan which could be there but those are like things in the future at this point of time it is more about retaining our quality customers with a ibl kind of a absolutely so lot of the studies that we were doing on our retention levels we saw many of these customers kind of leaving after three or four cycles with us uh and the question was why and the answer was that they were going for individual based loans from banks or sfbs and these were our dream customers so why should we use them you know we can service them uh, just as well as any other bank can got it sir thank you thank you that was really helpful thank you the next question is from the line of Savijan from 2.2 Capital, please go ahead. Hello. Yes, Savijan. 
Yeah, and you mentioned that there were some liquidity challenges during the quarter. Has that uh, normalized now this quarter? Yes, yes, it's uh, completely normalized. In fact, okay. in fact, we are facing a reverse issue. I see, largely speaking, as we were approaching our CAR ratio, obviously, uh, you know, most banks do not wait for your debt equity or capital adequacy to go down to 15. So that was one challenge. Macroeconomics was another challenge. And frankly, we have not faced liquidity uh, issues in our, uh, you know, at least for the last 10, 12 years. Uh, but yes, for a month, month and a half, we did face some issues that has been largely solved thanks to the recent fundraise. Uh, and it also gave us some time, uh, fortunately, to uh, transfer and transition into our new LOS and LMS system. Uh, so all in all, uh, we made good use of it as well. Okay. Uh, this um, this CCD and everything, you know, for the rating agencies, do they consider that as equity or? Uh, the they, CCD you know, is considered as pure equity, is a tier one equity. Uh, because it's compulsory convertible. Okay. In uh, case of OCRPS, it's a tier two equity until converted, because it's an optionally convertible, or you can redeem it as well. Uh, but yes, CCDs is considered as pure equity, and uh, OCRPS is tier two equity. So it's like a hybrid debt. So they will at least use the CCD uh, calculate. They will include CCD for. They'll give the benefit of CCDs for your rating improvement. If, you know, yeah, and and some portion of OCRPS as well because there are multiple investors. And uh, I think if you look at the balance sheet, uh, and as Jandra Bai said in his speech also, under NDS, uh, hybrid debt instruments have to be split between debt and equity. So uh, the net worth you'll be seeing is around 311 crores, uh, while fully diluted net worth, if you consider everything converting, today would be 362, 363 crores or something like that. So already there is a discount given because of the hybrid nature of these instruments in the, in the net worth of the balance sheet under NDS itself. So, and this individual loan that you were talking about, isn't the same as MSME? Is, is, what is the difference there? Similar, similar, but the clientele is slightly different. So on one side, we are, in the MSME side, we are finding cash customers, and it's a cash-based collection. On the individual uh, business loan side, which are graduated microfinance customers, you know, so the underwriting might not be as, stringent because we have, you know, four, three, four, five years of experience with them. Uh, but we have switched them to a cashless collection model. So as I said, Savi, we are planting seeds. Uh, uh, you know, yes, there are some similarities for sure between the products, uh, especially as far as ticket sizes are concerned on average. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the sourcing is different and the repayment, uh, co the collection methodology is different. Okay. And these SM, MSME loans, you know, which you're doing, uh, this is, uh, is this similar to what Five Star is doing, but lower ticket size? Uh, is that the right way to look at it? I'm not sure what Five Star actually does. Uh, five Star ka average, Ticket size is somewhere around uh, five, six lakhs, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, lower. But yeah, they only difference is they do secured. You do unsecured. They yield, your yields are obviously higher than there. But you know, is is it a logical uh, progression for you to move into higher ticket size and maybe secured? Is that possible for you? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's worth considering. The models are different. And uh, uh, with, I don't know five stars model, but largely speaking, it's a secured asset, which is difficult to repossess. Uh, let me be, so 
with the limited amount of research are done into it uh, of course there is a sentimental value of having your residence or your house uh, mortgaged uh, but in case of a default uh, very difficult to repossess these assets so uh, that is our that is at least my uh, and and i don't think that's a very big secret uh, over no, that's true that's true you know, uh, even equita says the same thing about the sbl customer but i think the difference on the credit cost is pretty for an unsecured loan versus a secured loan may, even though it may not be technically you know possible to repossess but i guess the credit cost is much lower just because of that fact that they kind of small mortgage their house you are absolutely correct and uh, we have discussed this both at a board level and individually as well it might be something which is a na- natural progression for us and uh, let's see uh, i think uh, certainly i'm not going to discount it as a viable division in the future i think the only difference is that uh, the gdp per capita in your state is much lower than the southern states and i think that that makes it more difficult to do it in uh, in, in in north or in you know in the in the rest of the country as compared to south of india the difficulty also lies in the fact of the uh, the paperwork and the legal work involved Uh, especially mm-hmm. if you talk about the rural areas uh, primarily mortgaging on in the rural areas at least is very difficult uh, because the paperwork is very weak mm. uh provisioning with respect to covid is that over in this quarter no yeah everything pre covid uh, which is assets dispersed prior to march 2020 as is done and dusted mm. uh, returned off or provided for uh, mm. so that's over with uh, yeah so what's yeah. but the provision is still seems a little high is it because you are providing uh, the standard asset provisioning has increased the asset size has increased the standard asset has increased and also the fact that uh, you know microfinance is no longer under the 1% loan loss regime uh, you'll have to expect a couple of percent so uh, we are monitoring that closely uh, and thanks to the rbi regulations also to certain extent it has been passed on to the customers as well uh, through margin increases and rate increases uh, but uh, but yes i think a lot of it is related to post covid uh, npas as well So, what is the standard asset provision percentage that you are now using? I mean, we are under ECL provisioning, uh, mm. so uh, so uh, our provisioning is 5.2 percent and NPA 3.2 percent. So, in a layman's term, you can call it 2 percent if you like on the standard assets. On the standard assets. Hmm. That's higher yes. than what it was pre-COVID. Yes. Yeah, it is definitely, uh, sorry, it's uh, definitely higher than the pre-COVID. Uh, again, uh, the reasons for it being slightly higher uh, is also the fact that uh, there are pre-COVID uh, which were restructured and are in standard buckets, continue to have a, a bit of higher provisioning, but they continue to be in standard buckets. So from that perspective, aspect also there is there and uh, overall uh, uh, you know uh, the, the management overlay that has been created during the covid phase, phase will be there for some time uh, till it kind of tapers off and we you know free look at the entire ecl model based uh, based on the overall uh, experience the last 5 years and kind of redo the yeah requirements i think as our auditor told us Okay, there are no black swans in ECL, no black or no white swans, only history. Mm-hmm. So why is it that we have been we have released provisions in the standalone uh, uh, numbers? They're mostly write backs. So a lot of these are write backs in the uh, standalone side.
Got it. So growth, uh, you don't have a number for this year. Do you have, you have, a, do you have a number for this for uh, this year and next FY24? Unfortunately, I mean, I wouldn't want to comment on the growth numbers this time. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but uh, I have a better idea for you. Thank you. Mr. Jain requested to join the question queue for any follow-ups. Also, participants are requested to limit their question to two per participant. If time permits, you may join the queue for any follow-ups. Thank you. We have the next question from the line of Srinath V from Bellweather Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, hello. Good evening. Um, Good yeah, evening. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, just want to find out from a NIM perspective, has the a new regulation kind of fully kicked in uh, or or uh, do we need to wait for a couple of more quarters for uh, the old book to kind of uh, get flushed out and the whole repricing? Are we likely to see some more NIM accretion over the next uh, couple of quarters? Uh, yes, I, I don't know. So uh, I think it will take a few more quarters. Uh, Vivek, I don't, no, no. I don't have that number of what percent of the book is yeah. new regime versus old regime. So, uh, uh, but okay. it will be a significant weightage at this point. So, at this point of time, uh, you know, you're not, uh, probably we don't have a specific number to share with you, but by a simple back of the palm kind of a calculation, at least 60% still continues to be old regime because we were about 1100 crores in uh, microfinance mm -hmm. uh, when the regime changed. And right now, if we are 1200 crores, so, uh, you count 90 crores of repayment as the amount. So, so, by that logic, largely, uh, you know, it will be a state of fifty uh, on that. But uh, since uh, the average uh, balance tenure uh, of the loans uh, as on, say, March 2022 would have been approximately 15 to 18 months. So, you know, it will take some time when it kind of completely wanes off. Now, as far as your NIM question goes, uh, see, our cost of borrowing has been going up significantly also uh, since uh, the last, because of the repo changes and stuff. So while we do expect uh, NIMs to increase uh, in the future, it will not be to such a large extent because it will be offset by uh, some bit of absorption, some bit of absorption in the cost of borrowing. Got it. Okay, got it. Uptrending NIMS, but the, the larger part of the NIM accretion has already taken place in the last two quarters. Fair understanding. Is that a fair understanding? No, I, I, I would disagree with that. I would say K, about half of it is done. Half okay, of it perfect. Perfect, Hello. Perfect. Cool. Uh, moving on, just uh, want to understand uh, you know, how has uh, been, uh, have you faced any teething issues in, in implementing the new regulation? Of course, we have a significant edge given that we already do all of this in MSME, but from what I remember, those uh, set of, uh, you know, employees are a, a grade or two higher when you hire them in first place. So, uh, you know, are you facing, uh, how is the on-ground situation on income assessment and documenting it and then, you know, kind of figuring out that I, I can't remember again, 50% or there's some limit the government has given. So how is this whole process uh, working on the ground and, uh, you know, how do you see that uh, improving over the next six, eight months or one year and so on? So it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a work in progress. I think uh, uh, overall, uh, you know, in April we had used our old system and kind of done a best effort job uh, of evaluating that is continuously improving and it has improved significantly with our new software conversion as well uh, as far as inputting all the right kinds of information to assess income. Uh, besides that, I think uh, since we are capturing household indebtedness, as a result of that, rejection rates have also increased. And I think that message has been consistent with a lot of the other MFI players as well. Uh, so all in all, I think uh, uh, you know it's the, the the rejection rate has slightly increased because of this. Like you got it, got it. Just pinching a last question before I go. Just I want to find out if you've opened any new geographies 
any new micro markets uh, and uh, if if we have you know made some progress on going into lower density areas because of the flexibility in pricing and and also have we disaggregated pricing because we have had a very different credit uh, cost experiences over the last couple of years in different micro market trends even from demon to today so are we looking at uh, disaggregated yield structures in different markets based on your risk perception and so on thank you yeah yeah so uh, we have not done that yet uh, that is part of the plan in the long run uh, maybe starting from uh, you know the fourth quarter or the first quarter uh, that geographic based pricing or risk based assessment pricing uh now as far as the micro markets are concerned no i think uh, the past couple of quarters have been challenging with a lot of different projects in our hands uh, with rbi implementation with software implementation with liquidity capital raise and stuff um, and obviously the growth that we are looking at uh, which is ongoing uh, but yes uh, that is something to consider i think i can confidently more say about the differential pricing in geographies uh, as far as moving into these micro markets you know that we are never a first mover into any kind of a new situation uh, so that will be sort of slower let us see what the competition is doing and what their experiences are in some of these markets uh, other than that uh, you know we recently moved into bihar uh planning to expand on that uh, in the coming few months and bihar has been uh, behaving wonderfully so that has been a pretty uh, decent foray into a difference into a new state is this running out of your uttar pradesh team itself or you've now kind of have a completely new setup put in and so on it will it will run out of up team until uh, q4 after that we'll uh, split it from q1 next year Perfect, perfect. Thanks a lot, Alok, and uh, congratulations for the great set of numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Yash Mande Mandaviwala from Mandaviwala Family Office. Please go ahead. Hi, hi, Alok. Congratulations uh, on a good set of numbers. Um, Thank you, Alok. We've just uh, you know most of the FMCG companies seem to be complaining about you know poor rural demand. uh yet uh, you know most micro finance companies such as yourselves uh, are reporting good collection efficiencies so you know what is uh, really happening on the ground uh, how is there this uh, you know divergence of commentary uh, on the same set of customers i mean yes i don't consider myself an expert on macro or micro economics all i can say is that we have not faced so much of a difficulty or so much of a feedback from our operations or field that people are facing any large scale difficulties as far as economics are concerned or weak rural demand or anything is concerned uh but uh, maybe there is a lag effect i don't know but uh, other than that i wouldn't want to comment anything more on that for it for it maybe let's wait and watch uh just one more on the new software system uh, so is the implementation now completely done and uh, i know it's early days but you know where are you seeing sort of large uh, differences or where are you seeing significant you know value add from the new software no so i mean already our tat has reduced by about 30 40% uh, so that has been a big achievement overall uh, it was very successful and a uh, lot of things had to go correctly it is fully implemented now and uh, you know we are collecting large volumes of data uh, we, uh, the the risk controls has increased skyrocketed overall with geo tagging and everything uh, we are using digital signatures now we have a tie up with legality uh we become paper completely paper. paperless uh so it has a lot of different advantages and uh uh yeah i think uh, 
overall it has already been a big success do you think in the end it will lead to the you know loan officer being able to handle a higher volume of clients customers uh it could but i'm not exactly sure whether that should be the goal because higher per person capacity also comes with his own set of risk when something goes wrong uh so when the delinquencies and stuff rise so one person is not able to manage such a large case load and uh, the group sizes also have been overall uh, in the industry going slightly lower as years go by but what it will help us in the future is ma- moving more towards the cashless repayment and in in that case yes uh an fo will be able to handle more customers but that will be a whole new model under the current model i don't think that is our overall goal uh, is to increase the case load for uh, fo although that might be an ancillary benefit uh, down the road got it got it thank thanks a lot alok that's it for me thanks thank you Our next question is from the line of Bal Krishna Vagasia from Axon Noun Investment Managers. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, team. Uh, many congratulations for the great quarter. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I want to know what, what is the uh, average turnaround time, customer turnaround time for l- microfinance and MSME business? uh so for microfinance it goes state by state i have the figures i think it's approximately 4.6 days the last i checked for microfinance so yes three days is the, uh, the the customary uh, or the regulatory uh, training that we have yeah so it cannot be less than three days uh, and uh, pre this uh, pre the software it was at least 6 to 7 days so we have brought it down to that much in msme we have brought it down from 12 days to about 8 days but there is still a lot of room for improvement there okay and uh, what is the branch expansion plan for the second half um so what is the plan is to open about between 15 to 20 branches uh for q4 we are still working on that so you'll have to wait on that question for uh the next quarter squad call so 15 to 20 branches in q3 correct okay. largely uh, like yeah more like uh, for the fy24 right so normally we've kind of uh, seen larger branch expansion happening in the first quarter uh, fourth quarter and the first quarter of the next year exactly so when we do our planning for fy24 uh, so lot of the branch openings will happen in you know february march april may time frame uh, but we don't expect a lot of business to come out of those in the current fy okay okay all right so uh, in terms of uh, the lend- average lending rate that uh, before the new regulation and the after regulation i mean the uh, post the uh, new regulation what is the change in ever change in average lending rate in um, microfinance that you have observed in your loan book about 2.5% has been the increase 2.5% okay and in terms of msme segment so 2 uh, 3 years back when you or 3 or maybe four years back when you started msme segment you you say that okay i i do the experiment initially and then if i i am satisfied about the scalability of the particular business then we uh, go with full force so like are you satisfied with the msme segment and you want to go on full throttle on this or what do you think or, or do you want to scale this business now we um, we are very satisfied with msme and it has it's no longer an experiment it is definitely a full blown decision uh, but as i answered the first question uh, i'll i kind of give you the same uh, answer is that uh, we are growing and we are growing well 
but it requires a specific type of customer uh, in the MSME. The rejection rate is still about 70% in that division. So if you are going to compare apples to apples in terms of growth rate for uh, compared to micro and MSME, you know, my lesson learned is that it's not going to be very comparable. Uh, but we are still growing at good 20, 25% uh, well, uh, on, a, percent on, on a YOI basis, what happens is uh, obviously FY22 uh, September, we had just come out of the second wave of COVID. But uh, still, if we use uh, F, uh, September 21 as a benchmark for both microfinance and MSME, I think MSME again in our case has grown the almost 60% from something like 125 CR as of September 21 to about almost 200 crores as of today, September 22. So I think MSME has been showing good uh, growth generally and uh, can see uh, good times going more forward as well. Okay, okay. And uh, uh, which segment among all of your like uh, microfinance, MSME, individual loan and uh, vehicle finance. So, which is the most profitable for you, con including the effect of NPS uh, as well? No, definitely. If you compare just the bottom line margins, MSME is the most profitable, followed by microfinance and followed by two wheeler. Uh, but I mean, these are very—I don't want to say very different businesses. They are not very very different businesses, but these are different businesses. You know, on one hand, you have a better growth potential. On the other hand, you have a better margins. So we try to take the best of both worlds and do both the businesses. Okay. And last question. Look, uh, uh, for microfinance, how many of your customers are uh, unique to you? Uh, so that is, I'll, all, I'll always give a disclaimer to that question. Unique to me only applies to when I'm pulling the credit bureau report and I find it as a no other financial institution where they have an active loan with. Uh, so that is approximately 25%. Uh, but after I loan them the money, if they borrow from somebody else, I have no track of that. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. And, and the, what is the cycle-wise classification of the borrowers, like first cycle, second cycle in microfinance? Uh, Vivek, you have that. So about uh, seven, sixty-five or sixty-five percent is first cycle customers, and sixty-five to sixty-eight percent is first cycle. The rest of it is second cycle and, and above. Exact breakout. Unfortunately, I'll have to pull it out. I, I mean, I have an idea, but I don't want to give you wrong numbers. Oh, that's all my side. All from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Amit Mantri from 2.2 Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, Alok. Uh, first, congratulations on, on the good performance. Thank you. Yeah, so on, I just wanted to understand. So in uh, uh, the MFI book, uh, what has been now the number on what percentage of the March 2020 book uh, went bad? So on a static pool basis, what was the credit cost of the MFI book? 10 to 12 percent. Okay, 10. So and so basically, post uh, COVID, uh, which is FI 21 and FI 22 disbursals, there you didn't really have any significant credit costs, is it? Uh, not yet, uh, but we are expecting somewhere around 2 percent on post COVID, on a ongoing basis. Okay. Okay. Got it. And uh, the second question, uh, now, you know, the book, the book is almost close to 1,500 crores and you eventually, in a year and a half, maybe look to get to 2,500 crores. So on the management side, senior management side, have there been any uh, additions that you're making uh, and plan to make going forward? Uh, we had a CRO who joined uh, Mr. Raghavan, the chief risk officer. Uh, other than that, uh, I don't know, of course, a lot of team members join, uh, not on a C-level position, uh, other than Raghu a second. 
But yeah, we uh, uh, we are looking at in in terms of an HR perspective, uh, also kind of uh, moving from a, a regional management system to maybe a zonal kind of a management, uh, wherein we kind of uh, dissect the entire uh, geographies that we work into various zones and kind of provide more uh, bench strength in terms of uh, the overall uh, operations. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Hiren Kumar Desai as an industrial investor. Please go ahead. Yeah, sir. Uh, congratulations on a good set of numbers. Uh, the question is: uh, in this inflationary situation, and uh, one of the participants asked about uh, FMCG sales being very low, and I mean, so some difficulty with the that section of the society so do we have a breakup of what portion of our loan is uh, for business or livelihood earning or something like that and what proportion is for consumption so as far technically all of our loans in microfinance and msme both are for income generating activities uh okay. which is not to say that once you give the money whether some of it winds up to consumer but largely speaking all of our efforts is to make sure that it's for some income generating activity okay and uh, the second question is uh, uh after the usage of this software and as we move forward uh, do we hope to see some uh, operating leverage in terms of opex uh, coming down as a percentage of assets or income uh, whichever way you look at i mean uh, so that is always a hope and uh, as jendra bai would put it that cost cutting and finding efficiency is always a constant endeavor uh, however you will find us to be quite lean overall uh, how much extra lean that we can become uh, uh uh you know i think the idea is to always find a balance if your goal is to become the leanest and the most cost efficient company in in, in the industry uh, you might get some good short term results but that means that you are not investing enough your people might get frustrated your retention might suffer and lot of other things might happen uh with the software definitely we are expecting to see efficiency of the fos increase in terms of the number of disbursements they can make and largely speaking the second biggest goal was to reduce the overall risk in terms of operations and in terms of credit risk to the customer so those were the large two goals with the software implementation last question if i can sneak in is while interest rates are rising assuming that uh, most of our customers uh, uh, borrow at a fairly high rate uh, uh, how, how sensitive are they to the to the uh, rate that we are charging the question is in the rising rate uh, environment uh, do you i mean have you correlated to some past cycles or something like that to say how it impacts our uh, growth surprisingly sir they are not at all sensitive to interest rates uh, and uh, largely speaking they are able to absorb 1 or 2% here and there without any problem and without even frankly speaking noticing too much uh now any large scale increases like 4 5% obviously it will be a problem uh but generally speaking you know for us going from a weighted average cost of borrowing of 11 and a half to 13 would be a huge problem because the roi will reduce by percent and a half for them it will make a difference of 20 25 rupees in their emis which most people don't notice or don't care enough about 
all they care about is timely availability of funds in the least hassle which causes them a least amount of disruption and hassles if i can put it that way and a good level of service thank you we take the next question as the last question from the line of savi jain from 2.2 capital as a follow up question over to you yeah hi uh, where does this equity take you in terms of uh, you know how many years of growth can be taken care of by this equity i mean that's the, that's the million dollar question <laughs> uh, you know you have your own uh, internal accrual so depends on what kind of roe we can generate and uh, depends on what kind of roa and internal accrual that we can get if we are growing at our rate of roe then we don't we never need to raise we can grow indefinitely on our own internal accruals uh but yeah. the base gets the need is somewhere in up 2500 crores yeah i mean uh, basically this equity raise just uh, it just kind of uh, the three years of uh, growth is and the leverage increase has been taken care of and now uh, now you are at a level where it's a, a comfortable car so at 30% growth rate and 30% roe you would not need to raise any equity exactly exactly so i mean 30% roe is difficult to maintain and if you are growing at 40% it will take it will take us far you know I, i don't think equity is a big big concern for me at this point uh, uh it it's not like uh, this was just kind of a teaser round and then 6 months later i'll need to go back to the market again uh, mm-hmm. so we should be i mean at the very least we should be op- given that there are no more surprises like covid or anything like that we should be good till at least 2500 crores Great. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that would be our last question for today. I now hand the conference back to the management for the closing remarks. Thank you and over to you. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining. Uh, we hope that we've been able to answer all your queries. Uh, we look forward to uh, the next interaction in the future. in case you require any further details uh, you can contact us directly or our investor relation teams uh, the contact information will be available on the presentation which is on the company website and on the stock exchanges uh, thank you again and uh, have a pleasant evening thank you very much ladies and gentlemen on behalf of infra liquidity that concludes this conference thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your